Hi everyone, I'm Gordon Half, technology advocate at Red Hat, where I work in emerging technology areas. And as part of that, I do a lot of work with Red Hat research. And the topic of my talk today is I'm going to take you through sort of some of our thinking around setting up Red Hat research, some of the things we're doing at Red Hat research, and some of the things that we've learned in setting up the program the way we have. But first, I'd like to spend a few minutes to talk about the nature of invention in the first place. Now, when we ask, how does invention happen? Probably one of the logical first places we end up is, well, there's an inventor, of course, and on the right-hand side here, we have the first marine chronometer, which was important for determining the longitude of ships at sea. You needed precise time on a rocking sailboat, which made traditional clocks not work very well. And Leonardo da Vinci, famous artist, famous inventor, and we could go down a whole list of things. Probably most of you at some point in high school or whenever uh, probably had to memorize a whole list of inventors of various technologies. Now, there's a couple of things wrong with sort of this mindset. The first is that certainly people do invent things. I don't want to take that credit way, but they're almost always based on pre-existing work of various kinds. The other thing we find is that when people are listed as inventors and you really dig into the stories, usually those stories are a lot more complicated. There were various people doing different things at about the same time, taking different approaches, but in our, really the, the need to have an inventor is so ingrained that you almost always come up with an, an inventor for the thing. Um, and that's what makes it into the school books. Now, particularly as products, technologies got more complicated, we start to see more invention at really the company or a team within the company level. So if you look at something like the Ford Model T, for example, you know, Henry Ford gets a lot of the credit, probably rightly so. Um, however, obviously there were teams of engineers at Ford Motor Company who made the assembly line happen, made the Model T happen. It wasn't one individual who did this. However, there's really kind of an other mode of invention. And I think I alluded to this a little bit when I was kind of talking about how individuals invent things based on prior work. And that is, it's been well recognized for a long time. That if you look at, for example, how um, viticulture happened in Southeast Asia and Europe, there are patterns of spread of technologies over time. And this seems to be a natural process. That was, you know, there was no board of viticulture spreading this knowledge. This knowledge just kind of happened. And this has been well known for a long time, but wasn't actually studied until relatively recently. And in 1983, uh, a researcher, professor at University of British Columbia, R.C. Allen, studied this idea of collective invention, this idea of informal knowledge sharing. And specifically, he looked at the 19th century uh, steelmaking industry in the UK. And what he observed was that a lot of knowledge seemed to be being informally shared uh, between companies and by individuals moving from one company to another. Now, companies at that time generally didn't have corporate research departments. They, most of these inventors uh, at these companies, with few exceptions, aren't very well known. 
But he found that things like chimneys get incrementally higher, or there were incremental changes that seemed to be coming from some sort of knowledge diffusion, and he actually studied this quantitatively. And the other thing he found was there were patterns here. You, you had companies that seemed to be out ahead of making changes, and then you had other companies that just kind of followed what those first companies have. And what has happened in more recent years is that you can look at a couple of different things, and this is where we're kind of getting into how we're thinking about the Red Hat Research Program, is research obviously happens in academia. A lot of this is actually a relatively recent process. A lot of the academic research we think of was really kind of a product of around the World War II era. There was, there was research in universities earlier, particularly starting in maybe the later 19th century, but sort of the modern research university is, you know, is probably less than 100 year, years old, and these are some institutions in, uh, in uh, the Boston and Cambridge area, uh, institution in uh, Brno, obviously, and what we can kind of see, say about this academic type of research is you do have a lot of collaboration in academia, but it's often in silos. IP uh, licensing may be a consideration. Actually, some of the big research universities make quite a bit of money off of licensing their IP. Um, one thing we can all say about academia is it can be rather academic. It can be not terribly rooted in real-world use cases and practices, and this is a concern uh, that played into getting Red Hat Research started, but we also see this in some of the big research universities where there's been some deliberate efforts to do more collaboration across different uh, specialties. Uh, in academia, they use a lot of open source, but work actually working in open source, working in upstream communities may not be familiar. And what academia tends to produce is sort of the uh, almost stereotypical publish or perish. Uh, they do fundamental research and they publish papers based on that, and that's very important for you know both uh, PhD students, for example, getting their thesis, and for professors to get tenure. Another phenomenon that we've seen over kind of the same period, maybe a little starting a little earlier, is the idea of the corporate laboratory. Uh, uh, Edison's lab uh, is sort of famous for this. Bell Labs is a very familiar example. Um, but a number of large companies have had fairly well-known corporate laboratories, DuPont in the chemical area, top right, that's IBM corporate lab uh, up in Yorktown Heights in New York. Uh, interestingly enough, IBM, when they started out their initial corporate lab, uh, it was actually located at Columbia University in New York. So IBM was actually a fairly early on example of an academic and corporate collaboration. Uh, in terms of research. What can we say about corporate labs? Well, you know, they were mostly limited to dominant firms. Uh, you know, it's, it, the typically companies that, you know, had some sort of um, monopoly, either, you know, kind of legally, as in the case of Bell Labs, or de facto in terms of companies like IBM and DuPont in the chemical area. And it's because basically their financial situation allowed them to put money into labs that weren't necessarily going to have short-term uh, benefits to the company. Uh, there didn't tend to be a lot of collaboration outside the labs. They were sort of famously a lot of collaboration within the labs, but not necessarily between companies. They're, they are generally looking to make money in the long term. Uh, they've tended to be, and companies have gone back and forth a bit about this over the years sometime, but they're, they're tending to be wanting to have uh, results that have some immediate 
benefit, or at least not if not immediate, relatively near-term benefit. And in fact, a trend that we've seen over the years at uh, in corporate labs has often been that uh, they you know they will sort of go off in more academic territory, and particularly if profits go down a bit, they'll kind of get sucked back into the product development space. Uh, and you know that research, so the research can end up looking a lot more like development. Uh, and the output here is well, patents, uh, fairly famously in the case of IBM, uh, and working artifacts of various kinds, something practical. Again, there may be collaboration papers and so forth. If you, know, you look at somebody like you know, Microsoft Research, for example, or Google, uh, but um, that's not really the primary thing they're trying to accomplish. And, you know, we bring this to open source, and this is sort of the ultimate knowledge diffusion, and the IP concerns are mostly handled by uh, things like licenses, maybe trademarks. Uh, the, m most of the bigger successful products out there, uh, projects out there, are very collaborative. Um, open source has tended to work better in software than in other areas. Uh, there are some other things like hardware, for instance, in RISC-V, uh, ISA, but it's been harder outside the software space. And again, like Alan's knowledge diffusion, they tend to lean towards the incremental, and the output is obviously code, although, again, we're trying to broaden that out uh, to things like operational knowledge and so forth. And one of the nice things about open source is what Jim Zemlin of the Linux Foundation calls these virtual open source cycles. Uh, so you have projects that lead to products, products hopefully make money, and if they do, that can feed back into the project, so we can pay developers, for example. So we set out to, at Red Hat to think about how can we organize deliberate invention that pulls in some of that virtual, virtuous cycle that I described and really have a model of a research organization that brings in that open source that can combine some of the academic type of invention and some of the corporate type of invention. And that's sort of where we've ended up at Red Hat Research. So start out Red Hat Collaboratory at Boston University uh, in Boston, obviously, started 2018. It was a joint project by Red Hat and BU. And the goal was basically to advance research in emerging technologies in, in areas of joint interest. So in the case of you know, Red Hat, it's been mostly things in the loosely defined uh, software infrastructure space. And we've had these collaborative teams of BU faculty, uh, PhD students predominantly, although not exclusively, and Red Hat engineers. And we support fellowships, internship programs for the students, organize joint talks and workshops. Uh, we, we've also been expanding this to other universities, uh, including in Brno. However, um, we, we've been very deliberate about this, and I'll talk about some of the lessons as we go on here, to not try to boil the oceans here, but to really focus you know, where we can have a real effect and a real difference. And from Red Hat's perspective, this is run out of the office of the CTO. Um, so, the mansion, we're predominantly in uh, West for Boston and Massachusetts, uh, Brno in the Czech Republic, and Tel Aviv uh, in Israel. Uh, there are some other projects going on, so it's not exclusively, but again, we've tried to keep this focused uh, in a manageable number of areas. Uh, we publish a quarterly magazine, 
We have internships. Uh, we do uh, we do mentoring with students uh, closely. We have some Red Hat engineers who uh, teach classes, and we have Red Hat Research Days events, which will hopefully go back to in person one of these days. Obviously, haven't been in a while. Um, so what kind of projects do we do uh, in terms of kind of scale? Um, some of you lo looking at this you may be familiar with some sort of like three horizons planning model. And to me, this looks a little bit like that, that you have large scale projects, smaller scale projects, and speculative projects. And, you know, essentially this corresponds to the amount of funding uh, and the amount of Red Hat effort that go into these. So, you know, there, there are projects that are very well established. Uh, we know there's something there, basically, but we want to do more with those projects. So, so something like Ceph, for example, is probably a good example here. You know, it's very visible. There's a number of people involved, both from academic uh, background and from Red Hat. Uh, and often these are built up from something that has already been proven, uh, may even be a product based on it. And we just want to make some uh, changes, improvements. Uh, speculative projects, you know, are like, hey, this is an interesting idea. Don't know if there's anything there or not, but it's worth putting a little bit of effort, putting a little bit of money into this, and uh, you'll see if there's something there that's worth spending a bit more effort on. And uh, then small-scale projects are kind of in between those two. Uh, one of the kind of the general ground rules here is this is all open source and publicly available. So this is, uh, we're, we're not interested in working on closed source in, uh, in this context. Um, there's a bunch of related work uh, predominantly uh, coming out of our, our Boston and Cambridge based, uh, based efforts. Uh, there's sort of this complex sort of interlocking of different organizations out there. They're doing various things in terms of providing uh, kind of research work into large scale cloud. Operate First is one very currently active project. We're looking for ways to kind of bring open source approaches uh, into uh, an operational context rather than just software development. Uh, looking at telemetry as part of that and again, a number of these other projects that are a combination of Red Hat funded, partner funded, Massachusetts government funded, uh, university funded. So there's a lot of related things that are kind of going on in this space. Um, so, you know, we've had a lot of success here. We have uh, quite a few uh, Boston University professors who are involved in this, specifically, again, in the Boston Cambridge area. Uh, we have a lo very large number of uh, OpenShift compute platform uh, licenses that have been donated to Mass Open Cloud. There's a ton of Ceph storage, which is uh, con being increased continuously, and uh, you know we've uh, funded a lot of uh, of public research uh, over the last five years, and we've influenced other you know other research um, that's going on as well. Um, some of the areas we're working on, I mentioned Ceph. Uh, unikernels is is an interesting area, basically uh, Linux-based unikernels, and there's an article about that in a recent Red Hat Research Quarterly issue. Um, FPGA tooling, and there's also some work going on with RISC-V in conjunction with FPGAs. AI ops, a uh, lot of self-tuning. Uh, there's been some other work in the AI area as well in terms of uh, preserving privacy and data sets. So uh, differential privacy, uh, homomorphic encryption, uh, 5G uh, project uh, 
uh, specifically with Northeastern in that area and looking at various types of uh, software verification. Um, what we learned, well, just giving money isn't enough. Uh, the, the sort of the people component here, the internships, the mentorship, uh, are important. I mean, you, you need money. You need money at the end of the day, but uh, this isn't just a case of writing a check. And I think related to that, there really has to be this joint commitment. Um, Red Hat or industry more broadly needs to work with academia. Can't just go off in its own uh, thing and do it. Um, and again, these are all kind of part and parcel of the same thing. Uh, the senior engineering time has has definitely been a bottleneck here. Uh, and again, can't just write a check. You you know you need to supply the the senior people to do the mentorship and the work. Um, there does need to be local involvement. Again, that's you know why we're not doing this every place. Uh, you do need some focus. As I say, we've been focusing in areas that are primarily of interest to Red Hat. And I think we've, did, we've over time, we've sort of discovered the, the project management and so forth associated with this is something that really needs to be thought about deliberately. You can't just do this all ad hoc. So what's next? Uh, feel free to reach out to me with any questions. Uh, Feel free to subscribe to Red Hat Research Quarterly. Um, there's a digital version available, HTML, on Red Hat Research website. Uh, and we also have a very nice print magazine. And um, we're going to continue to have uh, Red Hat uh, Research Days events. We've been doing these uh, virtually as shorter um sort of self-contained pieces because nobody really wants to be in video all day. Uh, but hopefully we will get back to person one of these days. So with that, thank you. And I can take some questions.